uh, please welcome Vidya Dahijia, George Mitchell, Kavita Singh, Naman Ahuja, uh, Andrew, and uh, moderated by William Dalrymple. I think he's just on his way. So. It's very subtle. So. Welcome to the first session after lunch. No snoring allowed for any of you who've had large lunches and <coughs> too many of our delicious Kingfisher sponsored beers. We have now a session <coughs> built around Vidya De Hedges' wonderful book, The Body Adorned. And if any of you want to buy one book on Indian art, other than Naman's wonderful book, which is <laughs> not there, but for the purpose of this session, if you want to buy one uh, book on Indian art, I would, could recommend no book more highly than this. Academic books on Indian art are not bestsellers in this country, but Vidya writes with such fantastic erudition and with such beautiful prose and such fantastic <coughs> clarity of thought that she's turned what could be an obscure subject uh, into my favorite book on Indian art, actually, to put it uh, bluntly. Uh, and she will put forward her thesis over the next 20 minutes. Uh, the idea behind this session is that, in broad terms, there is a strong and obvious distinction between the attitude uh, to the body and sexuality and sensuality between the Abrahamic religions and Hinduism. In the tradition that I was brought up in, in Roman Catholicism, the body is considered in general to be something tainted, an obstacle to salvation. Uh, that it is something which separates you from the divine. In the Indian tradition, as explained by Vidya, the tradition is quite other. That the body is the central subject in Indian art and the sensuous body uh, is its apogee, and that the body is something regarded as something godlike, which can be perfected, which is an ideal. And there is a strong contrast between these two, which perhaps Andrew might like to complicate, because in the Renaissance, maybe there was a slightly less um, negative attitude towards the body and sexuality, maybe. I, maybe anyway, we'll bring you in at the end to, to give a, a spin. We'll be staying mainly in India, but... Um, uh, having seen Andrew's barnstorming performance this morning uh, uh, and realizing that the subtitle, yeah. <laughs> and realizing that the subtitle of his book uh, was Sacred and Profane, it seemed an obvious thing to, uh, to bring you in to give a, a Western, um, a, 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 the <coughs> reflect what we're saying off Western art. So, Vidya, do you want to take it away? Absolutely. And um, perhaps I could uh, ask you all to turn your attention, not to me, but to the screen which is going to have these images I'm talking about. Now, Gorgeous, isn't he? Slender, elegant, gentle smile, richly adorned. 
hairlock swept into a turban of sorts, sensuous, poised, quite divine. But wait a minute. He is literally divine because he is no less a god than the great Shiva. And the same applies to the glorious, glorious image of Uma. The Western tradition has generally spoken of God having made man in his <coughs> own image. Without the slightest disrespect, I counter that in the Indian artistic tradition, both visual and verbal, you will hear a lot of poetry, um, artists made God and goddess in their own image. I must preface my remarks about the sacred sensuous with a word or two about the centrality of the human form in India's artistic tradition. It sets it apart quite distinctly from other Asian traditions like those of China and Japan. Landscape, for instance, rarely played a role in Indian sculpture. <coughs> It was only as a setting for the human figures that were the focus. Look at these two portrayals. One of the teacher in a forest, the other of a poet on a mountain top. In the Chinese example, the setting is emphasized as the human form. You almost have to search for that poet. The Indian example focuses on the figure of the sage, merely adds a, a little bit of greenery above to suggest a forest and a couple of deer below. It was the complete human form that was the main theme for the Indian artist. Now, this central positioning of the human form vis-a-vis -vis nature, which is so evident in the art, is equally evident in the Indian literary imagination. The glories of nature are visualized and compared to the beauty of the human <coughs> form and human erotic love. For instance, there's a stone inscription of 30 Sanskrit verses in which the earth and sky are described as embracing each other and then kissing a temple. And the verses are an inscription of the late 12th century to record the gift of a temple. And here's what it says. First, gratified as it were with the close embrace of the ties of the earth, the surrounding sky like an accomplished lover, accompanying his action with a smile of love, eagerly kisses, as it were, the face of fortune, this temple. So inanimate man-made objects were frequently evoked in terms of a woman's body or compared with the coupling of human lovers. We have another record from Palam, today's Delhi, dated in the year 1227, during the rule of a Shaka king named Nasruddin. So this is an Islamic ruler in which a well and its waters are compared to a beautiful woman slaking the thirst <coughs> of her lovers. Here's what it says. May the well, like a lovely woman with rotund, upheaving breasts, gorgeous with undulating necklaces, who satisfies the thirst of many a lovesick swain, decorated with the riches of flower-tufted plants, may that well be for your gratification. <laughs> but back to the divine body. How does one come to terms with the idea of a sensuous sacred being? Can a god or goddess to be approached with veneration also arouse passionate adoration? And even more puzzling is the phenomenon of divine couples, <coughs> Shiva and Parvati as here, or of Vishnu and Lakshmi, portrayed as a loving couple. Note, the god's left arm reaches around his consort to cup her left breast. Sometimes, some sculptures have his right hand turning his beloved's face towards him to gaze into her eyes. Yes, I admit they're partners in a divine marriage, but the sensual nature of the imagery seems in many ways to be a sort of contradiction in terms. So what am I going to do to appreciate better how the sacred may indeed be sensuous? I am going to quote from a variety of literary sources. There will be courtly literature. <coughs> There will be sacred hymns composed by saints and acharyas, and there will be inscriptions. And all of these point to the fact that one easy, direct approach to the divine is through reveling in the sheer physical beauty of the god and goddess and adoring that divine body. All the sets of written sources, all three of them, also echo visual imagery of the type that you are gazing at right now in proposing an open celebration of the deity's enjoyment of erotic love. 
and I'll give you my interpretation in about 15 minutes. Okay. Now, don't get me wrong. I know India has many parts to the divine. There's name a few yoga, there's meditation, there's renunciation. But for most people, it is the path of bhakti, of that intense personal devotion to a chosen deity. And within the many strands of bhakti, one major path of bhakti is through extolling the physical beauty of the divine. Let's look at a few images, visual and verbal, to make these points. A chola bronze of Nataraja, divinity and sensuousness combined in a single form. Exquisite face, elegant torso, perfectly proportioned thighs and legs, gently curved yet tight behind. The wondrously handsome Lord of Dance, whose dance of joy is of course in sync uh, is with ph profound philosophic thought. But the saints, the Tamil Nayanmar saints, who sang about this form, left that sort of explication to philosophers and scholarly commentators. They were writing for the ordinary devotee. They chose to extol rapturously the beauty of Shiva. There is seventh century saint Appar, wrote many poems about the beauty of this form. And I'm going to read you just one verse that says that so great is the beauty of Shiva's dancing form that even rebirth on this earth should be sought after, since it gives you the opportunity to gaze at his beauty. <laughs> his arched eyebrows, the gentle smile upon his lips of kove red, his matted locks of reddish hue, the milk-white ash upon his coral form, if one may but see the beauty of his lifted foot of golden glow, then indeed one would wish for human birth upon this earth loses so much of its rhythm when translated into English. In Tamil, Kunitta Purvamum Kovvai Shedvayil Kumin Shirupum Panitta Shadayum Pavalampol Meniyil Pal Venniyirum Initta Mudaya Yedutta Punpadamum Kaanapachral Manida Piraviye Venduvade Inda Maanilatte Now the same upper sang rapturously of the beauty of various other forms of Shiva and he repeatedly evoked sweetness that is, of course, directly captured by the artist. Upper addresses Shiva as sugar and honey, mm. the very terms that are used for the beloved around the world. Listen to the start of these three consecutive verses that extol Shiva. Honey, milk, moon, and sun, <coughs> youth crowned with the celestial white moon, wisdom incarnate as the fire that consumed the god of spring. How can I forget him? Sugar, sweet syrup of sugar cane, bright one, brilliant as a lightning flash, golden one, my lord who glitters like a hill of gems. How can I forget him? Sugar cane, lump of sweet sugar candy, be in the fragrant flower, light that dwells in every flame. My lord who loves flower buds gathered at dawn. How can I forget him? Another way in which the Tamil saints attempted to convey the beauty of Shiva was to describe the compelling impression it left on the viewer. And one such image that they approached in this manner is Shiva, as you see him here, as the enchanting mendicant, Bhikshakana, who is forced to roam the earth with arms bold in hand, with a serpent knotted around him to serve as a loincloth. But as you see, the active serpent has a mind of its own and fully reveals Sh Sh Shiva's form. The sculptor has modeled the figure to create the vision of a bodily manifestation in which Shiva stole the hearts of all the women who came to give him arms. They were all fully aware of the incongruous nature <coughs> of his beauty, yet they were enamored of him. And I'm going to read you one verse from many written by Saint Sundarar who lived around the year 800. This is all verses put in the mouth of the lips of the women who come to give him arms. What strange attire is this of yours? The music of the Tamil tongue adorns your speech, the while the serpent dances on your hand. We bring you arms, but how to give it to you when your serpent hisses? Pray tell us, handsome one of the forests, you are finally where fragrant groves abound. Does not the radiance of your form mock the glory of the setting sun? They express passionate longing, these women, for physical contact with Shiva. 
and it's directly expressed in a conversational poem by the same Saint Upper, in which each verse describes a love-struck woman speaking to her companion. Here is one such verse. Listen, my friend. Yesterday in broad daylight, I'm sure I saw that holy one. As he gazed at me, my garment slipped. I stood entranced. I brought him arms, but nowhere did I see that cunning one. If I see him again, I shall press my body against his body. Never let him go, that wanderer who lives in Otriu. So artist and poet are making it evident that a major part by which to approach the divine is through appreciation of distinctly sensuous beauty. And it would appear that sheer physical perfection of form was considered a reflection of spiritual beauty and supremacy and inseparable from it. <coughs> Goddess Uma, we move to her, invoked by artists and poets in comparable manner. Slender figure, sensuously modeled, breasts softly sculpted, flowing curve of the stomach, heightened awareness of form on the right, a swaying sense of movement. On the left, it's, it's Parvati performing tenor, so she's standing straight. Saint Sundarar, once again, 800, evokes Shiva accompanied by Uma in one of his poems, and each verse's co verse commences, Shiva passed this way and follows its description of the god with a phrase to describe Uma. He passed this way with the young woman whose mound of Venus is like a cobra's spreading hood. He passed this way together with the young woman whose soft breasts fill her taut bodice. He passed this way together with the woman whose smile is white as pearl. He passed this way together with the woman perfectly adorned whose mound of <coughs> Venus is veiled in cloth. Describing the body of the goddess was not just permissible, it was a wholly appropriate tribute to her to do so. Let's move to God Vishnu. And I'm going to read you the passionate approach adopted by a 12th century poet, Acharya. This is not just a poet, but an actual teacher, Vedanta Desika. And he wrote a poem titled, Ladder of Meditation on the Lord. What do you expect from the title word meditation? Well, in this case, it is a joyous meditation on the glorious body of Vishnu. I'll quote a couple of verses to give you an idea of Desikar's ecstatic vision, which is addressed actually to a cult icon of Vishnu within the Sri Rangam temple. So it's directly addressed to him in it. This is verse three. O Lord of Ranga, I see the exquisite curves of your calves. The luster of anklets bathes them in colors. Swift runners between armies in time of war, long ladles to catch the liquid light of your beauty. Their loveliness. Might, they, they want you to raise your mic a bit. Uh, yeah. um, their loveliness doubled by the shade of your knees. Seeing them, my soul stops running the paths of rebirth. Verse 4 moves to the thighs. They seem like firm stems of plantain growing in a pleasure garden, wrapped in linen cloth, <coughs> on fire in the dazzle of the jeweled belt. They are pillows for his wife's Kamala Bhumi Napinne. Ah, my mind plunges into the mysterious depths of Ranga's young thighs as into a double stream of beauty. Here's the summary, verse 10. So my mind touches the lotus feet of Ranga's lord, delights in his fine calves, clings to his twin thighs, and slowly rising reaches the navel. It stops for a while on his chest, then after climbing his broad shoulders, drinks the nectar of his lovely face before it rests <coughs> at last at the crown's flowery crest. And the 12th verse hands us the clue to the whole thing. It tells us, that Desikar made this poem for those who long to climb with ease the hard path of the yogis. So he's telling us in no uncertain terms that the path of beauty is the easy path to the divine. That of the yogis is hard and long. Let me turn in the last five minutes 
to the even more puzzling aspect of Hindu imagery, the celebration of the divine union of God and goddess in terms of erotic love. Down the ages, artists have taken pride in portraying the loving intimacy of God and consort, and you'll find such imagery <coughs> across the country, north, south, east, and west. Shiva's and Uma's delight in intimacy, physical intimacy, was a theme for joyous celebration, not merely in literary work, and in poetic uh, verses of the saints, but even in inscriptions. Yes, inscriptions of all things. They are mundane things. They are supposed to record the grant of lands or money to a group of Brahmins or to a temple. They often record the construction of the temple to give you the genealogy of the donor. And here's the overlooked point. Inscriptions always commence with a verse or two in praise of deity. And very frequently, these verses use overtly sensual language to describe the amorous activities and the bodily beauty of the gods. The, the Ratnapur stone inscription, for instance, of the year 1163, it records the construction of a Shiva temple, various shrines and step wells by a feudatory prince. It commences with this verse in praise of Shiva and Uma. May the divine half-moon-crested Shiva increase your welfare. He who has three eyes, as if because of his desire to see simultaneously at the time of playful amorous enjoyment, the pair of gold pitcher-like breasts and the lotus face of Parvati, daughter of the mountain. What an amazing conceit to conjure up so fanciful a reason for Shiva's third eye. <laughs> A siloed Baba ruler of Orissa invokes Shiva, praising him, describing the disheveled nature of his hair resulting from Parvati's lovemaking. <laughs> May the matted locks of Shambhu, in which the particles of ashes are separated by the overflowing waters of the Ganga, which are touched by the soft rays of the moon, um, and which are slackened because of their not being set aside, on account of Parvati's union, accompanied with the grasp of his hair, may those matted locks protect you. Now, the inscriptions actually clarify, in my mind, the purpose of their vision of divine lovemaking. Here is one inscription, the Kalinger stone inscription of 1211, uh, which starts thus. May Shiva, who experienced the delight of an embrace from Parvati, multiply your excessive delight. The implication is clear, that the dedication of a verse on the love of Shiva and Parvati was intended to bring down that similar divine conjugal bliss on the person who dedicates the poem. As a corollary, I suggest that the dedication of an image of Shiva and Parvati as conjugal lovers is similarly intended to bring down that divine conjugal bliss to the donor of the image. And it's pretty much the same when we turn to inscriptional eulogies of Vishnu and Lakshmi, as you see them here. For instance, the Karhad copper plates of Rashtrakuta King Krishna III, so this is 959, commences thus. Triumphant is the leaf-like hand of Vishnu, which, being placed on the jar-like breast and face of Lakshmi, that are marked by shining particles of nectar water, proclaim the entrance of the world on a joyous festival. And once again, here's another one explaining. May Lakshmi's hand, which caresses, in the course of a turbulent sexual act, the neck of Vishnu, whose ardor is undiminished, <coughs> may Lakshmi's hand grant you happiness. <laughs> I submit that we may need to think of these images in the context of puja and prasada, which with all of you are familiar. Our puja offerings to the deity of a temple where there's food, flowers, coconuts, uh, silk, are presented to the deity by the priest. The deity accepts the offering, blesses it. It is returned to us in the form of prasada. I see the commissioning of an image of the conjugal bliss of a divine couple as a prayer for the trans transfer of conjugal bliss to the earthly donors, a prayer for prasada in the form of marital bliss. Thank you.
in, in your book, you use these wonderful tracks of, of Tamil poetry to elucidate the, um, the, 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 the sculpture and, and to shed light on them. And you, you quoted us um, an example of a poet looking at a sculpture. Do we have any evidence of the reverse? Do we have any evidence that the, the, the sculptors are using this poetry or are reading it? Um, we actually do have one example. We, um, there are 9,000 inscriptions of the Cholas, of which only 3,000 have been published and only 2,000 have 2,500 have been translated. But among that corpus, we have one in which the poet actually quotes from a verse of, uh, the, the artist or the donor in his inscription quotes the verse that he obviously was impressed by and suggests to the, to the artist that he um, produces that, that image. So you do get interactions in both directions? Uh, yeah. I would, we, we do at the moment have only one example, but I'm assuming that there are more and we just haven't come across them. But it's also implicit, isn't it? In it? I mean, it's... it's I mean, my can't hear you. My it's, it's implicit in the imagery. It's not always... It might not be absolutely word for word. It might not describe it, but it's, it's inherent in the imagery, that knowledge of that particular type of sensuality that you have in bhakti poetry is very much the type of sensuality that you find associated with the sculpture. Um, I agree with you, absolutely. And it's also the fact that it's in the Tamil language. It's not in Sanskrit. So it's the language that um, would have been understood by everybody, spoken by everybody. It's not the refined Sanskrit of the court. So I think it would have been more accessible. The sculptors today, when you go to um, Tanjore and, and um, what's the village called where they still do the sculpture? Swami, Swami Malai. Malai. Swami Malai. Um, they're, they're very much from the Brahmin caste and they are literate in Sanskrit. It, would the same have been true then? Is, it, is this a Brahmin only Sanskrit reading world? Um, well, well, let's, well, the point is, would they have been able to read it themselves is the big question. What was the state of literacy? Did the artists themselves, were they literate? Or were these chanted? There's an, it's an oral tradition and, and all of these poems are set to music. So they would have been chanted and perhaps what they are hearing is the hymns being sung rather than actually reading them as such. And the same Chola courts which commissions the first of these couples, how many, a thousand are made at the, at the beginning of the, or, the, the big temple, there's an inscription that records the number, isn't there? Um, yeah, at the big temple, there were only 66 images, but there were so many temples that within 100 years, there must have been several hundred images, maybe more. Prepared. Um, Namana Huja um, has just closed um, an incredibly, a totally remarkable exhibition, which I had the privilege of seeing in Brussels. Uh, on the body in Indian art. And, and there you make the point that, in a sense, it isn't just connected to fecundity, that bo the body has an incredible range of, uh, of uses in Indian art, and a whole range of, of references. Well, without getting into all of that and all those other references, I do want to actually broaden by, which was <coughs> the intention of the exhibition and the book, uh, but really looking at the sacred and the sensual. I was intrigued to look at how does this, this medieval Hindu bhakti response to sexuality and, sensu and sacredness compare with very early ancient Indian ones or later medieval ones? How does it compare with Jain and Buddhist uh, art being made at the same time in the Indian subcontinent? Um, are the constitutive elements of sensuality the same across chronological uh, uh, divides, are they different, of course, and depending sectarian, on and sectarian, sectarian divides or caste ones, or in fact, even uh, with, with relation to, you know, I mean, is a Buddhist or a Jain medieval response art historically, is it challenged by this flood of Hindu sexual imagery, both in poetry as, as well as in, 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 in the sculptural record? Um, are they forced to capitulate and make equally sensual images? Um, is that happening as a, as a dialogue? Um, these were questions that I felt, um, really, what, what are the elements that make up the, the sensual? And I was wondering if you wanted to talk more about that. Um, 
I do believe, um, well, we can take South India separately from North India if you wish. Uh, and in South India, when you look at an image of Shiva and you look at an image of Maitreya, the future Buddha, it's only when you look at what's in their hands, the actual object they're holding, that you can almost tell them apart. So they are in an ethos where this poetry is there to a certain degree. Um, when you, then in northern India, I guess you have to turn to Buddhist, uh, the evolved Buddhism of that time and the evolved Jainism of that time where you have multiple goddesses that have entered into both Buddhism and Jainism. <coughs> and those figures are absolutely, in a way, as sensuous as this. In Jaina? Jaina uh, is yes, sensuous? like uh, if you, for instance, at Mount Abu, you would see that the figures of Padmavati or Saraswati uh, that they are using are equally sensuous. And then, of course, the inscriptions that I quoted are all, some of them are in local Prakrits, but some of them are in Sanskrit, and many of them are from, uh, you know, Orissa and other places like that. So it's across India that this sort of, um, what should we call it, this sensual, the importance of a, a, this one approach to the deity. There are other approaches, as I keep saying, right. but this one through physical <coughs> beauty seems to be across India, it seems to me. Because, sorry, the fascinating thing, of course, is that you have um, the antithesis to sexual beauty as a part, also as a codified part of the aesthetics of iconography. So, for instance, the very nomenclature of a god called Kubera, uh, the one whose bera or body is bad, poor, ku, not suvera, <laughs> you know. Uh, he's, he's, a, he's a big fatty. It is a big fatty, yes. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> there is, oh, for instance, uh, the idea of codifying, along with all those lovely six mothers, the seventh one that stands in the group is Chamunda, and the very fact that you have the skeletal body codified as an aesthetic counterpart um, to the idea of the sexualized bodies of the, of the mothers in the rest is in itself a, a very sophisticated codification of both the thesis and antithesis in the same block. I've just come back from the, um, yoga ex the, the Art of Yoga exhibition in DC, and the first room there is full of yoginis who, who studied uh, your, the yogini temples of your PhD, I think, was originally. Yeah, a little, yeah, little after yeah. that. Yeah. Um, and what was striking there, looking at it as an outsider, was the, that you had these incredibly sensuous forms, but yes. they also had fangs. Yes. That they, were, that they were both horror and sex at, what, at once. Power and sex. Power and sex, which yeah. is a good combination. Yeah, well. <laughs> <laughs> if I can just, um, you were talking about whether this went back further. Um, I've just spent some time in Dunhuang in China. Uh, on, the, on, the, on the Buddhist Silk Route, looking at the caves there, and I was allowed um, really to see very, very well um, the earliest great cave, which I think is 256, and it's 6th century. And even today, going around with a Chinese archaeologist, he said to me, look at this Indian painting. <laughs> look at the sensuality of these bodhisattvas. Imagine you're a Chinese in the 6th century, and you've had this afterlife worship, but you haven't really seen anything like these dancing bodies. And it's true, you go into that cave, which is probably a processional cave from its design, so there would have been music, dancing, maybe chanting, and you see these bodies, and if you imagine seeing them by torchlight or firelight, they would even dance the more. But they are immensely sensual. This is one yeah. of the oddest things in ancient Indian art for, for an outsider coming into it, uh, is you go to someone like a janta, and you know it's a monastery. So this is a place where celibate monks are living. And but the, the imagery on the walls, is a lot of it, is, is, is bare-breasted maidens playing around <laughs> in palace gardens. What's going on there? Well, I, <laughs> <laughs> but if I could no, jump no. in there, and in fact, uh, Andrew's already taken us once out of India, and now I can do it again, and I can uh, read a little passage that I've brought, and it goes like this. And my heart and my veins and all my limbs trembled and shuddered with desire. And I was in such a state so passionate and so terribly unknown that I thought I should not satisfy my lover and my lover not fully gratify me. Then I would have to desire while dying and die while desiring. And 
I imagined all my limbs breaking one by one and all my veins were separately exhausted with pain. The state of desire in which I then was cannot be expressed by any words or any person that I know. This much I can say about it. I desired to consummate my lover completely and to that end I wished inside me that he would satisfy me with his Godhead in one spirit and he <laughs> shall be all he is without restraint. And this is a 13th century Belgian nun called Hedewitch. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you mentioned um, earlier today the Bernini's orgasmic St. Teresa. Oh, St. Teresa, yes. Teresa of Avila, um, you know, Car Caravaggio's depiction of the whore Philip de Melandroni as Catherine of Alexandria caressing the sword that will so to speak, phallically penetrate her and turn her into a bride of Christ. <laughs> and there's a huge tradition within the Christian religion of, of particularly for women, of, sort of, as it were, diverting their sexuality in exactly these terms <laughs> towards Christ. And, uh, what who's that? Hildegard? You, that's Hildegard of Blingen, or who, who is that? No, no, that's Hedewitch, who is the 13th century, St. Catherine of Siena in the 14th century, a nun from Italy, believed like all nuns that she was wedded to Christ, but she had a mystic vision in which Christ appeared to her in their wedding. She opened her chest and gave him her heart, and he gave her, as her wedding ring from him, his foreskin. <laughs> <laughs> and then you have a Viennese nun in the 14th century who also had a dream about Christ's foreskin, and she dreamt that he came and he placed it like a wafer in her mouth, and it was... <laughs> Your poem reminded me of this. It was sweeter than honey. <laughs> sort of like a divine polo mint. <laughs> like a divine polo mint. <laughs> like a divine polo mint. <laughs> you know? And uh, the point about all of this, actually, William, is when you frame this session to say, how can the sacred be sensuous? And I'm sitting and saying, how can it not? Because if you think about the experience of sexual rapture, and the way it is in your body, but it lifts you out of this body and out of this world. How can cultures everywhere not have thought of this experience as an experience which is like the mystical, and as you were saying, becomes a gift from God to you, from God's body to your body, you know? And uh, in uh, the nuns that I was quoting are actually medieval, but if you look at the art of Catholicism in the Renaissance and in the Baroque period, there is any amount of incredibly sexual imagery, sexy imagery. And you have Leo Steinberg's book, which is called The Sexuality of Christ in Art History and <coughs> Modern Oblivion. And to me, the modern oblivion is actually the most important it part is. of the title yeah. because it is about how we have learned to unsee yeah. such a tremendous amount of sensuality which is out there in all of this art. So actually it says something about all of us here that we can look at Indian art and we can say it's terribly sensuous and we look, can look at Renaissance art and say it's terribly rational. It's I'll tell you, a very good example of this. I was working with a cameraman and cameramen look very, very clearly at paintings and they look, through, look at them through lenses. Botticelli's um, Birth of Venus. Mm -hmm. If you look at Botticelli's Birth of Venus, which is a gift by a Medici prince to his bride-to-be, and if you look very closely, as Venus leaves the sea, in other words, she leaves the zone of where you can't touch her, and she comes to land, so this is the Medici bride. And she's going to get married. Yeah. She's going to enter the world. She's going to bear children. I can't remember which, what the name of the mythical handmaiden is, but the mythical handmaiden holds a cloak very carefully like that, and she's going to put this cloak on Venus. And if you look at the fold of the cloak that she's holding, it is a vagina. It just is. <laughs> and within it is a leaf. So at the center of the world's sort of second or fourth most famous Renaissance picture, there is an image of a vagina which nobody ever sees. <laughs> George, um, we've been talking, take it back to India for a second, a lot of what um, Vidya was saying was Tamil specific. It was Tamil poetry, it was Chola bronzes. Uh, and one has this impression that ancient India was very um, sexualized and very at ease with its sexuality. I think Daud Ali in his book on court culture in any medieval India says that 95% of surviving Sanskrit plays are about sex and love. 
that, that we, yeah. you know, Shakespeare has nothing on. <laughs> the same uh, as Shakespeare. But how, it, you've worked, you spent so many years thinking you said to be the last great Hindu we empire. We Is there anything any, going on there? This we time? don't have any. <laughs> <laughs> we don't have any physical bodies, oh. and we have very few sculpted uh, bodies Mike. of Humphrey, sadly. Mike. Mike. Oh, sorry. We, we don't have any. Uh, can you hear me now? No, no, no. no. Uh, we don't have any, uh, very few physical bodies and very few sculpted bodies at Humpy. But, uh, but something I wanted to bring up, deriving from your excellent lecture this morning on Caravaggio, who are these bodies? Whose bodies are they? We learned this morning the scandal when Caravaggio's religious topics, when they were unveiled in the churches and everybody, including the priests and the cardinals, immediately recognized all the prostitutes. It's a subject <laughs> to, be, to be thought about. How did they know that Lena was the chief prostitute in Rome at that time? There must have been some familiar. But let's say in temples which were paid for, commissioned, and were executed under particular political and economic patronage, paid for, the gods had names which were like the kings. The kings and the gods had similar names with Ishvara or whatever afterwards. What would they have recognized when they entered the temple, the guardian figures, the beautiful women under trees, the, all the accessory imagery, whether it's Kajaraho or Patadakal or places that you've all been to? And I think there must be a very strong connection between the court and the ideas of what a beautiful guardian male figure or beautiful courtesan all these ideas which are in literature, which are in poetry, and which are in devotional um, texts, but actually were aimed at in the everyday life of that very privileged court. And there's no doubt that 90% of the imagery in most Indian temples is of our world, even if it has been slightly reconfigured, multiple arms, multiple eyes, mul all that stuff, you know, to give us the divine references, but just think, of the costumes, the jewelry, the weapons, all those things on the bodies that we see in Indian art, they are things to do with our world, the world of men. Not the everyday world maybe of the street and the prostitutes of Rome, but that very privileged um, elitist world. That is what I think is being reflected there. And in a way that um, title of that exhibition we did many years ago in London called In the Image of Man has some oh, resonance yeah. in it. That was you two. No, it no. was. It was I was involved in this. Yes, so it was a title that came out of that this Indian sculpture, this world that is created through painting, m metal, and stone, to some extent reflects and is in the image of our world. Um, not everybody's world, not the streets of Rome or the everyday streets of, I don't know, Kanauj or something, but that very elitist world. And so I'm trying to suggest a political, economic, a sort of, you know, this world of patronage to create this enduring courtly world of gorgeous bodies. We've got only a few more minutes. Maybe the, the, the final thing we should do before opening it up to the floor is, is to take it from where we were here with this incredibly open sensuality to where we are now with 377. Uh, first of all, the, the, the halfway point. Um, Kavzi, could you talk a little bit about how there, on arrival in India, Islamic art changes into something quite different to something that you would find anywhere else in the Islamic world, the sensuality that you see in a lot of mogul painting, for example, or just the, the body, the, the iconography. No, absolutely. So. This is also one of the reasons why most of the general surveys of Islamic art don't include Mughal art as part of that heritage because it seems so alien to the broader scheme of things. And it's as though the kind of iconophilia, the love of images, you know, humanoid images that is everywhere over here infects every aspect of Mughal art as well. And you have in Mughal art an enduring love of bodies and love through bodies where you have love stories and you have them quite senselessly told. And even by the time and of Muhammad Shah Rangila, a copulating Mughal monarch. By the monarch. time of yeah. Muhammad Shah Rangila, a very <laughs> stately scene of the emperor in yeah. imperial population with someone with his sword and his halo and his attendant girls absolutely intact. 
And it's very, very different from, let's say, other Islamic traditions that had painting, because if you look at a Persian painting of the Shahnama scene, where the hero spies a heroine bathing naked in the stream and falls in love with her, you cannot imagine what the fuss could have been about, because those female bodies <laughs> are like lollipops, you know, it's just a circle <laughs> for the head, and then the body is a cylinder. <laughs> no, but if you, uh, if you think about, for instance, um, the Sufi manuscripts that were made in the Sultanate period, Mm -hmm. um, where there is a whole heap of uh, love poetry, yes. some of which is quite explicit, you know, the Chandayan or Lord Chanda, yes. for instance, or yes. the Pem name, or, uh, you know, whether it's Bijapur or going all the yes. way up to Palam, um, there is a, uh, there are a whole heap of manuscripts that are produced, yes. which it seems that the early Indo-Islamic manuscripts being produced in the subcontinent are also are already very occupied with, yeah. the, with the idea the, of um, sexuality and yes, romance. Yes. The Sultan of Mandu producing his aphrodisiacs and these nice pictures of all the girls. Uh, the, the pictures yeah, are no, a little no, less no. nice than some of the ones Norman has going around in his little head. <laughs> <laughs> I've seen some of those slides and I think there should be an occasion to share yeah, the wonderful Sultan so experience. The, the, point, the point being that that we can establish that, it, that the, the common trope that you hear, that it was the arrival of the Muslims that make the women cover up and that, uh, that destroys sexuality, that is not true. Norman, do you want to? Oh, I, it's such a com complicated thing because, I mean, <clears throat> the body being revealed, our colleague, um, Farul mm -hmm. at JNU, for instance, for instance, often talks about the fact that if you look at the Ajanta ladies, the, right. the high-born ladies, she says, are often covered while if they're, uh, sorry, while mm -hmm. high-born okay, ladies are often covered. uncovered while their attendants and servants um, Or the courtesan, the dancing girl girls in the scene that she's talking about. That's right. Actually, um, is the only one with a blouse. And so um, this business of veiling and unveiling, I don't think it's as straightforward. I don't think a veiled body need be any the less sensuous, and I don't think it was seen as being. Mm -hmm. I think the nature of the drapery that is devised in Gupta and post-Gupta sculpture, which consciously clings to the body, is meant to be able to arouse with the mere act of clinging and veiling the body. Mm. Um, so I think there are uh, ways in which costume and attire and adornment have been used in order to facilitate sensuousness. You, uh, you indicate in your, in your exhibition catalogue for the body in Indian art uh, that in the end, though, the, the, you, you, it's the colonials, it's the Brits that do the cover-up. <laughs> no, I don't claim that, and I think you know, that's a hobby horse you have in reading my, my text in yeah, the way yeah. that you have. Yeah. <laughs> but, but I think uh, uh, there has been, as Kavita was saying, an extraordinary amnesia, a visual illiteracy that has spread where we've become uncomfortable about looking at our own pasts and reading them for what we can actually see rather than reading them through lenses of a kind of education that we might have been reared in. And I think this is not just, it's not just India that's culpable of this, but it's endemic across the world. And I think more, more people need to, need to be trained how to look in Vikram, in Vikram Seth's wonderful essay in India today, uh, uh, after 377, he, he disputed the fact that, I mean, the, the, the justification for a lot of that repression was it was against Indian culture. And he, he makes the very strong point that this is not against Indian culture, that you have, in a whole variety of ways, um, the central... Well, I think, um, I think certainly in the Rajput courts, the poetry, um, th there's definitely lesbianism mm -hmm. going on in, in the, all the Rajput courts. The poetry reveals it. There are two women who are talking to each other while their men are on the battlefield. Uh, and that's very clear. Uh, I, the, the gay part, the homosexual part of it. In Alain Danielou was in fact the first one to really go and photograph um, images. Uh, Alain Danielou um, in the 1930s and 40s, well 40s actually, went and photographed small niches in Khajuraho and uh, in Orissa and some certain other places that showed men together. And th they haven't been very widely published, those photographs, but they exist. But you know, in fact, although we might be able to look at this piece of evidence or that piece of evidence to show that Indian tradition was like this or was like that, to actually predicate our freedoms today on 
what we think was part of tradition is a very, very bad argument to make. Because we can always then find ways of manufacturing the kind of tradition we want to have. And I suspect after the next general election, we're going to see a lot of examples of that. So I don't think that we should ask for our you know, freedoms today in terms of that we already had them. Exactly yesterday. the same thing was. Yeah. Um, exactly the same thing was done with Hussein and his drawing, the angular little line drawing of Saraswati. And instead of saying, why not? The thing was, of course, but we've got all these ancient images. It's a similar sort of thing. Using that to justify this is a similar sort of. It's a trap. Yeah. It's a trap we should stay out of. What about the idea of the sensual male? Um, outside, you know, the fact that you have a semi-divine category like Shala Handikas or Apsaras, um, which are there to perform a function of being sexually alluring. Um, is there such an equivalent <laughs> in your readings? I think all the Dwarapalakas are all... Demonic and... No, Bali no, a lot of them. I mean, look Big at boys. Sanchi. You've yeah. got the male sexual organs going through the, um, through the drapery. And the, the, the notches move to one side so that you can show the male sexual organs. So at certain stages. And in quite stages, a lot of Gupta sculpture, too. Yeah. Uh, the Buddha himself in, in the in early Rastapati sculpture. Early. And that's the whole point. The fact early. that the transformation, uh. as you, in, in one of the essays that you'd edited for representing the body, I think it was. Vishaka uh, Desai. Yes. Essay, yeah. uh, also in this, the Buddha is Chakravartin. If you are a Chakravartin, you are virile and therefore you have to show the sexual organs. And as soon as that Chakrabartin idea with the Buddha goes, the Buddha becomes a little desexualized. Which is, uh, again, what some scholars have said about the image of Muhammad Shah Rangila, that it's a political point, mm -hmm. uh, that having this image of the, of the emperor making love uh, is to show that this emperor, who is in some ways politically impotent, in fact, has still got lead in his pencil. So all, all of the poetry about the rulers uh, when it gives their genealogy, the fact that they were attractive to all the women in their kingdom is extremely yes. important. I mean, it's yeah. as important as ability to win wars and to supply food and agriculture and irrigation and everything else. Uh, yes. well, the, think of the film stars today. Sex appeal, no? It's a big thing in this country, as in most others. Don't deny it. Remember Shiva when he appeared in the forest? He had long hair, he was naked, and he was beautiful. <laughs> the beautiful but it's in your pocket. Vidi, do you want to have a last sort of closing statement before we open it up to the, the floor? No, let's open it to the floor because we they okay. won't have enough time. So please, questions. Hand raised over here. Uh, it's interesting that you call it uh, the, uh, the sensuous and not the erotic, because nowhere do you see any erections in the sculptures. I mean, you may see it in tantric paintings. Is this because, um, you know, the shibboling already exists as a symbol, or is it just a practical thing that it would get very easily knocked off in the sculpture? <laughs> <laughs> Well, I, I cannot. They, they do get very easily knocked off. Um, <laughs> the, there's a famous um, British connoisseur of the early 19th century called Richard Payne Knight, who, among other things, was responsible for telling Lord Elgin that all his marbles was a fa were fakes. But Richard Payne Knight had a collection of, I think, 723 Roman and Greek phalluses. <laughs> Which just demonstrates your point. You know, it does. It does. It, it is very easily removed. Well, um, but to, just to quickly answer that question, in a <laughs> which I really appreciate what you said, um, that is a sort of a whole different category, and it's all mixed up with: is it tantra? Is it tantric? Um, and my aim was not to look at copulating couples, but to look at 
the sacred images. I mean, that is a whole category that needs to be worked with, and people like Devangana Desai have done magnificent work on that. But I, I put that into a different category, and therefore my, my focus was on something which was very much more widespread throughout Indian culture rather than restricted just to tantric you uh, do, rights. You do get a great deal of, of that in painting. And, no, and in sculpture. In sculpture. There is, uh, there is an, in fact, an, there are a number of sculptures uh, <laughs> which have two. <laughs> George, stop it. This is <laughs> <laughs> well, there is there is a fantastic sculpture in the Bhopal Museum who ha who sports not one but two phalluses, and this will be both erect. What? And just, this, this will be this will be on show at the National Museum in Delhi after the sixth of March. Uh, Tickets can be bought. <laughs> to say that there are actually many depictions of. Uh, men with erections in Indian art. About erections without men. <laughs> 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 um, that, that's the Pen Knight collection. You walk into a Shiva temple, maybe some of you. Yeah, yeah absolutely. The Linga. Well, that was the point. That's what her point was. Because that exists. Yeah. It was. Maybe we should move on. <laughs> <laughs> Over here. Last, Last question, one. he says. Let's have a more flaccid question this time. <laughs> <laughs> well, we are talking about Shiva and Uma as the natural forces of energy. And uh, within the context of marriage, do you see in Indian art or in historical context this bliss without the context of marriage? Um, there are loving couples in so many places. Um, and let me just put it into a Buddhist context for the moment. Um, for instance, at the caves at Karle, this is a monastic site, a monastic cave, and you've got these mitunas, they're called in the inscription, loving couples, more than life-size, eight of them in the veranda of what is a Buddhist monastic rock-cut chapel which is not attached to a town which is away from everything. So the importance of the, the, the couples were auspicious symbols. They were symbols of fertility, of abundance, of, of prosperity uh, in, a, in a much wider sense. And they are not, they're calling them mitunas. They, it's never quite clearly specified in that case whether it's married. But you find the same at, say, sites like Nagarjuna Konda, another Buddhist site, where your, your scenes from the life of the Buddha are punctuated. The punctuation marks are couples. So you move from one scene to the next, in between is a loving couple, a loving couple, and another loving couple. So it seems to have been very widespread in both a Hindu and a Buddhist context, certainly. But the other short answer is Radha Krishna. Hmm? Yeah. Radha, Radha Krishna. Krishna. Radha and Krishna mm, are yes. married. Which yeah. is explicitly yeah. adulterous. I yeah. think she is married to someone else. I think we're enjoying yeah. 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 Exactly. Yeah. to bring this to an end. Speaking of Shiva, I can't help remembering the mural in uh, Mutton Cherry palace, do you remember that one of the recumbent Shiva, and he's pleasuring I don't know how many women with every digit, shall we say, <laughs> I won't go into any more I, th I think before um, we get closed down, we close this down, so uh, <laughs> 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 thank you very much, Vidya Dehedja, Namna Hooja, George Mattel, Kavita Singh, and Andrew Graham Dixon. Um, yeah, we wish to thank Vidya Dehedja, Andrew Dixon, William Dalyampal, Naman Ahuja, George Mitchell, and Kavita Singh. Uh, the authors will be available at the book signing counter, which is on the left outside. And the next session is at 3.30. Thank you.